Welcome to the Leaders Agenda, a series dedicated to reimagining leadership within life sciences. My name is Tarja Huskonen, and I'm your host. The Leaders Agenda invites insights and perspectives from some of the very best leaders of our time. Wisdom that you too can build into your own Leaders Agenda. Hey, thanks for joining. Today's guest is David Rogers, who is world's leading expert on digital transformation. He is also a faculty member of Columbia School of Business and the author of five books. His landmark bestseller came out in 2016. It was called the Digital Transformation Playbook. And um, it has, in fact, been published in dozens of languages and is credited to have been defining the discipline by arguing that digital transformation is not about technology, it is about strategy, leadership, and new ways of thinking. Just last year, David published a new book called The Digital Transformation Roadmap, and we're going to talk quite a bit about that book. Um, just a couple more things about David. Um, he is, of course, uh, in the faculty of the Columbia Business School, but he is also helping companies around the world as they think about their own digital transformation um, going forward. Some of these companies include companies such as Google, Microsoft, Citibank, Procter & Campbell, Merck, C um, GE, and the list goes on. Um, David is also often seen as a keynote speaker in many different conferences and forums and has appeared in CNN, ABC News, Channel News Asia, and in the New York Times, Financial Times, Wall Street, and The Economist. I feel very, very lucky that we have you here with us. David, welcome. Thanks so much, Tarja. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be with you uh, and to have a chance to speak with you and with your audience. So I have to, I have to ask you, um, you, you have been defining really what digital transformation means. And uh, this landmark book, the book came out in 2016, um, and now you decided to write a new book in 2023. What prompted that? Well, um, you know, a couple of things. One thing that prompted it is that the world's kind of in a different place. I mean, the world's of business and this kind of thinking about this challenge of digital transformation. So when I wrote that uh, previous book, uh, the playbook, Digital Transformation Playbook, the, the blue book, as I call it now, uh, when I wrote that, this was a topic that I guess I would say some businesses really understood. Uh, they saw the level of change. We were already seeing multiple wave after wave of, of, of digital technologies really upending uh, business models, norms, changing customer expectations. Um, so a lot of companies recognized the need for really sort of fundamental change and transformation, but many did not, right? I met with a lot of senior executives and boards and people would say, oh, digital, I understand it's important, you know, for this part of my life or for that industry. But, you know, in our sector, we're a telco or an industrial manufacturer. We're, we're an education business. You know, perhaps we're a life sciences business. And, uh, or, or, you know, that'll have some impact on us at some point, but, you know, we're not sure it's, it's a top priority right now. That was kind of where the world was uh, eight years ago. I mean, I started writing the book uh, over 10 years ago, but at that sort of stage. Now, of course, we're in a very different context, uh, you know, particularly post-COVID. I would say the whole question of digital transformation for businesses today, it's no longer a question of if, it is solely a question of how, right? How do we do this? How do we actually do it right? How do we succeed? How do we make, you know, how do we create business value out of our digital transformation efforts? Because it turns out that's really quite hard. So there's a real difference in sort of where organizations are at and their sort of readiness to embrace the topic, um, but also as well, we are at a different point in the journey. So where that last book that I wrote really was trying to help companies who were ready, who saw the need for change, to really get past their sort of what I would call their blind spots, their ways of thinking about defining their business and particularly define the future of their business in terms of the products of the past uh, and the business models and sort of how their sector and industry had been defined uh, historically. And instead to really be ready to rethink some fundamental, you know, strategic underpinnings of their business. That's why the subtitle of the, that book was Rethink Your Business for the Digital Age. 
So it's kind of a strategy framework. How do we rethink the relationship or to customers? How do we rethink the dynamics of competition, whatever industry we're in, in the digital era? How do we rethink the, the value and the nature of data and its sort of strategic role? How do we rethink the process of innovation? And how do we rethink our value proposition uh, as a business? Now, what happened since then is I saw many of those companies who did embrace this early on, and they really started thinking about new opportunities of where their business could grow and where they should be headed towards. And it turned out that even if you were ready to embrace change and if you were able to shift your thinking and identify new strategic opportunities, the hardest part I kept discovering time and again was the organization. Legacy processes, ways of working, organizational structures, people, mindset, all these kinds of things actually turned out to be really challenging. And so that led me to why, really why write the next book. Uh, it is very much, it's sort of a companion book and it is all about that side. It's all about how do we actually rebuild our organizations and, for an era of constant change. And as such, the the target audience for this book, from, from my perspective, then became the legacy businesses, the business, the established businesses that are needing to really rethink themselves and ring, perhaps actually rethink their entire business model as a result of it. Um, so, uh, absolutely, that's that's really who I've been writing for for you know uh, over a decade, and 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 most of the companies that I engage with directly are these established legacy firms across different industries. Right. Now, the statistic that draws the attention of anyone who reads the book. You don't even have to read the entire book. You can just open the run front cover here and it will say right here, um, by their own admission, 70% of businesses are failing to transform across industries. Established companies are held back by bureaucracy, inertia, and old ways of working. How can businesses break through drive realty? So what's that all about is, is, when we think about inertia, we think about the failure rate is, you know, this show is called Leaders Agenda. Is that about leadership? Are, are leaders failing to kind of come to uh, the right place where in terms of what they need to be doing, where, where, we, where we sort of, what's the root cause of the failure? Sure. Um, and that's a really important question. Uh, that was really sort of the starting point of my years of research that went into this new book, was to really understand many, many, many instances we can find. Uh, the you know the clear majority of companies that have not just sort of talked about digital transformation and put it on a bullet point on a slide, but really you know put people and resources and made some kind of concerted effort uh, under this banner have reported that they are not seeing, you know, uh, the results that they anticipated. They're not creating value for the firm uh, and for the customers. So why is this happening? Uh, leadership, you asked, is absolutely part of it. Um, you know, I would say that it's not that we need more leaders who, for example, you know, are more deeply versed in technology and the sort of, you know, real engineering uh, nuances of it. Um, what we do need across the board is among other things, we need leaders who truly have what, you know, what's sometimes called a growth mindset to, you know, take the term from Carol Dweck, um, which is, you know, when she first wrote that, when Dweck wrote that, she was talking about individual learners and it was, uh, does the learner, you know, often a young student, uh, presume that they are sort of good at, you know, math or, you know, music or whatever it is uh, as an innate ability uh, and, or do they see what they are capable of doing as something that's fluid and flexible? And, and, and I might be terrible at math. It doesn't mean I couldn't become great at math. You know, uh, it's about experience and learning and, and, and so forth. And that's, that's the growth mindset. We need this in our leaders, uh, not just for themselves, how they think about themselves personally, but how they think about their organizations. I see a lot of leaders who really sort of define, well, what business we're in, what we can do, where we can compete, what value we can create. It's all based on sort of the history of what, where the company has gotten to today, rather than a mindset that, look, we may be facing tremendous change and volatility and new sources of competition and so forth and dynamism in the market in the next, you know, 12 months, let alone 12 years. Um, but that's okay. That's We are up for it. We are an organization that can do things tomorrow that we never did yesterday. 
um, and you take that as a baseline assumption. So I, I think that's one of the fundamental things that that we really need increasingly in leaders today that maybe we didn't need for a lot of organizations before. Mm -hmm. And change is hard, of course. So so it, that it doesn't we can understand it intellectually, but to actually make that then um, be part of the way we we start rethinking everything within our organization. That part is not very easy to do. We're going to talk a little bit more about that. But I think that one of the things you bring up is uh, complexity and, and the complexity of organizations and how do you, um, you know, how do you intertwine digital transformation inside a very compl complicated or complex organizational model. Really yeah, and that's yeah. That's, when I said people found it, companies found it very hard once they decided in, to sort of embrace digital transformation to actually carry it out. You know, one of the questions I looked at was sort of why and and what organizations find it harder or easier, and organizational complexity kept coming up. Uh, and, and that's this sort of uh, was kind of a light bulb moment for me was recognizing that, you know, if you're a company with 120 employees, single line of business, meaning you're serving a single sort of kind of market with certain, you know, homogeneous rel roughly needs, uh, and you're in one geography. If you're undergoing dramatic change in the market and you say, we need to actually pivot, change course, focus on a new growth opportunity, change kind of our strategy. If you have clarity around that and commitment to it, you can do it. It's rel I'm not saying it's easy, but it is relatively straightforward. Again, 120 people, single line of business, single geography. If, however, you are the leader of a company with 10,000, let alone 100,000 employees, you have different lines of business, which have now been set up as different you know, business units and to address different markets and have different needs. You're operating in different geographies, which have not only does that bring in sort of you know, supply chain complexity and time zone coordination complexity across you know, uh, uh, workers, but it brings in, of course, regulatory complexity, particularly if you're in a significantly regulated industry like healthcare or finance. For those organizations, if you have the same intention and same leadership commitment to driving significant change in the business, it is just going to be much harder to actually get that change to go through and propagate through the organization because as organizations become more complex, the default, the way we have built scaled organizations up until this era is in a fashion that increases sort of control and consistency, but forsakes and sacrifices flexibility and agility. And that's why we have to rebuild these organizations. Well, and then that, that brings me to that question, you know, we, what does rebuilding the organization mean if we, if we start peeling away complexity? What are we really talking about? Are we uh, are we rethinking um, management hierarchies? Are we rethinking the way that we operating across the world? These uh, some of these companies that you have also worked with, they are very large companies. They're global companies. Um, can you perhaps is is there an example of someone who has done this and has done it well? Do we have a model sure. as to what, I mean, what we should do? What does good look like? <laughs> that's the good news. So, you know, a lot of people read that 70% figure and they think, oh my gosh, this is so hard and how am I going to succeed and so forth. You know, I am by temperament an optimist. I'm a glass half full kind of person. So I hear that and I think, wow, that's exciting. That means 30% of digital transformations are succeeding. They are driving real business results. There's real change happening in the company. Um, and that means, you know, by now, given so many companies who have attempted this, we've got a large and diverse cohort of companies that we can learn from, right? So that was really my, my, my work in the book was to sort of look at what I call the 30% and say, you know, what do they have in common? What are the things... What is sort of the through line between them? They're all solving these problems in different ways, but there are certain things they are all doing in their particular fashion, their particular industry. And so that became really distilling that, the lessons of the 30%, that was kind of my guiding mission. And I ultimately developed a framework that I called the roadmap. And that is a five-step framework, which I see all of these companies doing in their own way. Uh, so, you know, very briefly, um, the first is defining a shared vision. 
right? If you are going to try to drive change and bring people along with you, this is incredibly important that leaders really step up the plate and learn what it means to define a vision that is unique to your organization, uh, that is shared by everyone inside the organization and commonly understood, um, and that actually makes a compelling case for change to all your stakeholders, right? Not just the people in charge of you know, P&Ls and your investors, but people on the front lines of each part of your organization. So that's the first piece you've got to get right. The second is you have to, what I say, pick the problems that matter most, right? Each of these is something that I see companies mostly do not do, which is why we have the 70% failure rate. Most companies do not. I walk into a, a, a meeting with a group of executives from different parts of a I won't name them, but a large, uh, real story, large uh, pharmaceutical business uh, a few years ago, right before COVID. And they brought me in for a whole workshop discussion on uh, digital transformation. And I said, great, well, let's talk about what's kind of the, the digital opportunity for your business. You're in different roles and different functions in the company. What does digital transformation mean for you know, company X? And I got a lot of blank stares. They sort of said, well, we thought you would tell us that. <laughs> you know, we're not, we know we're doing it. Our company hired a chief digital officer because our nearest competitor hired one six months ago. So we had to do the same thing. And we've been told we're going to be a digital first business and a couple other sort of generic slogans, right? Which is not what a shared vision is about. Um, but they really couldn't kind of put the words together to say, what did this particularly mean for their business, their organization, and their context? So and again- and you that, said that, that's the first step of the roadmap. Well, yeah. and, and so let's go back. To, and I know there's five steps, but I kind of want to go back to the the shared vision for just a little bit there, because you specifically made a distinction between more uh, sometimes you know too often perhaps um, we think about um, the vision in context of the monetary side of the vision instead of really kind of the 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 true value that we bring to the world. So I would say, uh, you know, because we are talking about healthcare and life sciences businesses uh, in, in this particular show, are patients part of, part of that vision? Should patients be part of that vision? Absolutely. Um, they have to be at the center of the vision. I mean, the, I've really found there's four elements that you have to have to truly have an effective vision that's really going to motivate and engage people, because that's the point. This is not about telling people what to do. It's about inspiring and aligning people across the organization, because you're a big company. I don't care how old-fashioned you are. You cannot, even if you want, control what everyone's doing. So the point is you want to inspire action and align that action. Right. So four things. One, you need, and all this has to be as clear and simple as possible. You need to just define or describe what I call the future landscape. Where is our world going? What's going on? What are the big changes happening in the lives of the patients, the healthcare practitioners, the governments or payers that we interact with, all these different parties that are that are so critical to the work we do, like our our, our scientists, our competitors, research labs, universities, what are the things that are happening in the world of, you know, if you're a pharmaceutical company or a med tech company or a, you know, a hospital uh, uh, chain, uh, whatever it is, what are the big sort of shifts? Where's your world going, right? This is why we have to have this transformation. And that's particularly, so that's, that's particularly important because I think you also talked about the fact that many businesses have kind of an unspoken assumption that the future is going to look a whole lot the same as the past. So we bring the experts from, you know, the big experts to talk about their learnings from the past, but we're not necessarily looking broadly enough into the future to see what's truly, and, and the signs for what may be coming in the future are often there already today, if we're just willing to see them, what you say. Yeah. Every, every, bolt from the blue, totally unforeseen inflection point that somebody talks about. I'm sorry, it's all been seen in advance. I've yet to see whether it's COVID or, you know, or, you know, generative AI or everything. If you actually talk to people who are working in that, you know, domain experts in that field, they've been seeing this kind of whatever it is emerging for some time. It's only been a question of how sort of how quickly and what's the timing going to be and what the impacts. So it's, it's really about, yeah, getting out of that habit of assuming that the future, this is human bias, that the future is going to look like yesterday uh, and that our lessons for the future, you know, are going to come from, you know, solely from the past. It's what a colleague at Columbia Law School, Phil Bobbitt, calls the, the Parmenides fallacy. 
uh, when you're considering a course of action, and you know we all have loss aversion, we're more afraid to take an action that might not work than to do keep doing you know what we're doing and not have that fail. But he says, particularly when you actually think about strategy, most people will actually go through the exercise and they'll compare, well, if we take this new investment or this new direction and they'll project what may happen, and then they will compare that against their current state, right? Well, right now, here's our financials or here's our market share or here's our this or here's that. And look what could happen if we go down this path. But he said, of course, the point is you're never going to be in the same state you're in now, right? The, 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 the baseline should not be today. It should be what do we? What's our best guess of what the future will look like if we stay the current course? So that's why you need to go through this exercise of really thinking about again what I call the future landscape. What are the key drivers? What are the new products that are emerging? What are the new entrants? What are the price pressures that are coming? What are the regulatory changes around you know from payments to data privacy? All of these things are are changing our, our context every day. So you you this forces you to recognize you know we don't have the luxury to sort of stand still. We've got to think about the world is a moving target, and do we keep moving? Are we kind of on a good path now, or what are the things that we need to adjust? Yeah, and I actually love that pivotal question of how long can we stay in business if we do nothing, if we just keep on going the way we did? I mean, that's an eye-opening question, right? If, if, if you can't come to it any other way, that question will actually prompt a, a very a different conversation. So then the next step is, Pick the problem that matters the most. And you start with the problem, not the opportunity statement, which we so much love because, so so tell me more about the problem. How do I come up with the problem the right way? I I call this stage, pick pick the problems that matter most. And so the point is, this is about defining strategy in terms of what are you going to do and what are you not going to do? What are you going to prioritize and what are you not going to prioritize? Um, it's very easy in digital transformation efforts. You start looking at lots of technologies and you get excited and you have this long list of all the things you could do. And, and any of them individually is an interesting idea or worth sort of considering. But then you have this initiative that's supposed to change the company and instead it's just kind of a hundred pilots shooting off in different directions. Um, look, I, I know you had Gary Pasano on and, and that was a point he was making about sort of corporate strategy in general as you guys were talking is, is that most companies you know, there's there's this you know endless list of like everything's a priority, uh, and there's if you know there's a lack of a sort of a shared understanding. Look, these are the things that we have consciously decided to set above others. So that's really what this stage is about. Um, and the thing that I've learned about strategy over the years is a couple things. One is is that it is that it's about choosing what to do, what to focus on, and what not to focus on. Right? There's always trade offs. The other is that it has to be done at different levels of the organization, right? It's not like a retreat that happens once a year and some team goes off and they figure out the strategy for the company and then that's published on you know email or the intranet or something and everybody's supposed to get briefed on it and you're done, right? Someone needs to be really defining the strategy for a whole enterprise, right? What's the future landscape? Also, you know, what what's our what I call our right to win, right? What is our unique opportunity, you know, sort of unique advantages and strengths as a business? What is our the case for change you alluded to, right? It has to be both financial, right? What I call a business theory, but you also need, and this is so critical for for healthcare, of course, is what I call the North Star impact, right? What is our impact on others, right? If we transform, if we succeed in really, you know, growing in new directions, how is that going to change the lives of patients, of doctors, of you know, societies, et cetera? Um, you need to think that through, and top leaders have to distill that at a sort of enterprise-wide level. But then they need to give the job, they need to hand it off and empower folks at each business unit and each function, you know, product development, you know, R and D. Uh, um, you know, marketing and communications, whatever it is, to then translate that and say, okay, look, I'm in the supply chain part of the business, right? What does this mean? I understand what, you know, the company, you know, I don't know who it is, you know, GlaxoSmithKline or or uh, Merck, Animal Health or whatever it is, you know, I understand what the overall company is trying to do and trying to achieve and really focusing on. I'm in supply chain. What does this mean for, for us? What is What are our top kind of growth priorities right now? 
and then actually continue that down, really to the level even where every team is looking, is understanding the strategy they're supposed to serve, and then is sort of translating that to their level and says, okay, this is this means what my biggest uh, strategic priorities are. Yeah, and I think I I think you're what you're saying here. So in some ways, we we often talk about that, and I I see these processes in companies here. They have. But often it is, by the way, it's the annual planning, and then there is all kinds of KPIs that fall out of that, and you're supposed to be responding to those KPIs. That's a little different process from what you're talking about. You're talking about active engagement. So if I start with the problem, and let's just say that I'm in healthcare field, and I'm focusing on patients. My, I can tell you that all the life sciences companies, all the med techs, biotechs, there is patients someplace there that they're going to uh, to um, very much and should be focusing perhaps even more than what they are today because the opportunities are many. And if we start bringing in sort of what's happened in the, on the patient side of things, I mean, we have made amazing advances in the last 10 years in all kinds of ways because of innovation. However, how accessible new care models have become has a lot to do with how we implement, how we translate those technology advances into real healthcare solutions. Absolutely. And, and, and you know, of course, life sciences is, is a, because it is so human centric, but also so sort of technologically cutting edge in terms of, uh, uh, you know, medical science. It's such a great illustration of this distinction, what we call you know, the importance of falling in love with the problem and not the solution, right? Understanding there's a difference between, you know, yes, we need the scientists who are pushing the science forward and creating CRISPR or, you know, uh, the first mRNA, you know, uh, uh, methods and so forth, and then creating something, but even creating something like a vaccine, right? Okay, that's solving a problem, right? This is now applying the technology to address a specific, you know, in the case of COVID, a pandemic, right? Uh, a, a new rampant virus. But you've got to keep focusing on what's the problem you're solving. Because, of course, as we know from our experience, having the vaccine enough does not actually make people healthy. There are all these other, you know, additional issues that have to be solved just as much as the, the mRNA development has to be solved. You've got to solve the distribution. You've got to solve the production. You've got to solve the public health. You've got to solve the acceptance. You've got to solve you know, the public health, you know, messaging and communication and how to get people in, in many societies like ours where, you know, lots of people don't have a regular relationship with their, their healthcare provider. And so, you know, they aren't ready or willing or comfortable to adopt a new, you know, a, a new kind of vaccine because they aren't having the conversation with the one person who is most likely to be able to actually really make this something they can sort of understand and, and, and think through within the context of their own lives. So all of these things, if you don't address these problems, building the science alone is not going to have the impact. Yeah. So I would then say, okay, so we need to, so I'm, I'm translating that back to sort of my frame of, I'm in an innovation process in, in, in typical life sciences organization today. Let's just talk about med tech or even diagnostic. I mean, diagnostics is a very hot field right now, because that's, by the way, that is where AI is already um, very much incorporated into innovation in very, very specific ways. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. But what it really means then is I need to understand what are the value drivers for the patient, what are the value drivers for the uh, providers, the healthcare system as a, at large, and then translate those value drivers. And the, and the payers. Right? And the payers. You know, so you know, You're absolutely the, right. And I'm actually, yeah, yeah, because that value driver needs to translate then to not just product characteristics, but actually on a number of other things, such as how we're going to use the supply chain a certain way so that we can keep the cost down, so that we can make that therapy more accessible to the patient so that we are able to ensure that we have continuity. Um, it, it, is a, it is a number of, of things that need to actually be thought through once that North Star vision is clear and we start translating that down to the next level. So I love the idea of falling in love with the problem. Um, and, and, and an example you just gave, it's, it's really about understanding every one of those stakeholders, 
you've got to get inside their context, get close, listen to the customer and learn what's their problem. What's their job to be done? What's the thing they need for this, you know, new diagnostic or medical technology or, or, or therapy to, to work for them, right? Um, and only when you solve the problem for the payer and the provider and the health system and the patient, only then will you actually have the impact that you need. And that can be a breakthrough. That can be the opportunity. Opportunity is really driven from the problem. But then you say your third step is validation. And validation happens on maybe you're already validating the problem. But tell me more about validation. What does that look like? So this is um, really about bringing a process of you know, rapid experimentation into every aspect of innovation. Um, and uh, so I actually make the analogy in the book that uh, uh, between, you know, for, for me, experimentation is, is how the way I define it in my own writing and my, in my work is it's any iterative process of learning what does and does not work, right? So that's something that you can do that applies to uh, scientific, uh, uh, the scientific method, right? It also applies to engineering experimentation by, you know, chemists in a lab trying to figure out how we get one molecule to bond with another. It also applies to business model innovation, marketing, uh, organizational design, improving your you know, employee onboarding, any problem you're trying to solve, you can take this approach and this mindset. I have seen, you know, it is common in life sciences businesses that because of the history, people are comfortable with that within the R&D side. Right. Those who are who are developing therapies or molecules um, or or maybe, you know, medical technologies even understand the idea of, oh, right, it's the only way you build that, you know, that great next breakthrough in, you know, whatever it is, open heart surgery, a new kind of, you know, vaccine, a new, you know, uh, 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 you know, a medical device that's implanted inside, you know, the, the patient. The only way you do that is through a lot of iterative testing and learning. You're never going to know at the beginning the exact right solution and you have to take, you know, the scientific method. But I, I make the comparison, any business innovation has to make the, go through the same process. It's just instead of testing, you know, scientific hypotheses, you know, um, hypothesis, you know, will the patient, the patient's uh, uh, condition will improve with this therapy. Okay. Uh, you know, will it improve or not? Uh, to what degree? How rapidly? What's the right dose? What are the side effects? Is there a difference between different and, and outcomes with different populations, you know, et cetera? Those are all, and we know that those are all hypotheses you have to, and many more that you have to go out and test and gather data and, and, and uh, iteratively learn towards if you're developing, you know, a medicine. Same thing with commercialization, same thing with organizations, anything for, you know, any business model change that you're trying to make has all these same unknowns. And the problem is for decades in business schools like my own and every other one, we have taught leaders that the way you deal with uncertainty is through planning and that that is the answer to every management challenge. And that is simply not true. Uh, when you are dealing with relatively, with actually very low uncertainty, when you're making marginal uh, slight changes to a sort of a well-established, well-oiled machine, and the context around your business is not really changing very much, and so you're just trying to get a bit better, a bit better each day, yeah, the old planning playbook that we've taught for decades is is appropriate or can 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 work. It simply breaks down when you're dealing with changing dynamic environments, different customer needs, innovation, new opportunities, trying to, you know, redesign uh, your internal business processes, all this kind of innovation, you have to throw out the planning playbook and you have to think like the scientist. You got to start with, you're not writing down a business plan, you're writing down hypotheses. Well, we believe that if we do this, the patient will adopt it and, 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 the, and the payers will pay for it because it's saving them in the long term. And we believe the regulators this and we believe whatever the different hypotheses are. That's but a mindset. That, it's a mindset shift. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think the, you know, the, science, the science demands it on, certainly on the, uh, on the um, drug development side, not necessarily on engineering side, though. The, you know, the, the mindset hasn't always been the same there. These iterative process then as we sometimes know of course agile development was one of the one of the ways by which those started to actually come into a lot of the 
yeah. corporate processes, if you will. But I, I must say, I feel that we're still missing the point a lot. And it, it is difficult, perhaps, partly because, and, and actually somewhere in your book, and we'll, you also talk about the, the importance of thinking about process as a conduit for changing culture and changing mindset. Yeah. But one of those processes yeah. that we have to deal with in in the healthcare side, in the medical device side, is you know, we are pretty much going with the traditional stage gate processes for product development, yeah. right? And so right. when you say, well, planning does not work. Okay, so planning, yeah. so so I mean it, and those were supposed to be in the early phases really about funneling um funneling out the things that may not work very well. And then I think the next business model was, okay, well, let's have um, a separate innovation process over here, and then we'll still have the stage gate process over here. Do you see a different way of making innovation sure. happen? A a absolutely. So, you know, if we're going to take this sort of experiment, this approach of defining and validating, you know, uh, hypotheses, if we're going to apply this to business, right, not just to science, you have to change the management processes. You know, one of them I talked about, one is through getting rid of moving instead of writing a business case. This is still most established businesses. If you want to do something new, what you're supposed to do is spend a lot of time writing a business case, which brings in a lot of third party data a lot of backward looking historical data, no first party data, and creates a series of uh, projections of the future. We think this is the market, we think this is the size, we think this is the margin. You fill in all these numbers and they add up at the bottom of the spreadsheet to you know uh, the bottom line and you here's what we're gonna do year one and year two and year three. It's all fiction, it's all made up, right? So we replace that with the hypothesis approach, right? With defining an opportunity, we say, here's the problem we think we're going to solve. Here's who we think the customer is. Here's how we think they experience, or the different customers and stakeholders, as we've said. Here's what we think each of them is lacking currently, what their unmet needs are, right? You lay out all these hypotheses, and then you start a process of experimentation. So I give tools in the book for any business innovation, any industry, that you can make this a systematic process. But, so that's the first thing you've got to replace, right? The second thing you've got to replace is the funding model. You cannot do this with traditional annual budgeting, right? You need to have iterative funding just as you have a process of iterative testing and learning, right? And this is a huge shift in process for most organizations. You know, it's a tried and true. It's not a new idea. Every single venture capital firm has been operating this way as long as there's been a, an approach to investing called venture capital. We have tons of understanding in life sciences and others. So it's not, it's not sort of an unknown approach. It's just not adopted for internal resource allocation inside established businesses. Most. There are those who, do, it can be done. There are those who have brought it in. And then the third, exactly what you mentioned, is this shift from the problem with the stage gate model you're trying to sort of manage uncertainty, but you're sort of going halfway there. And it, it doesn't really address the fundamental problem because it puts you into this, you mentioned uh, agile software development. Stage gate is what in software is called waterfall, right? So you have a process, you you gather all the specifications, right? You, you learn everything the customer wants, right? Right, that's in the requirements, et cetera, gathering, et cetera. Um, and then you're done with that. And now you start the next stage. And if it's software, you you know, you build the application, right? And then you have a stage that's like quality assurance testing, QA testing, and so forth. And then you have deployment, right? So you have these stages, and the point is each one time you finish the stage, you're done. Now, what happens in software is this, depending on the scope of the project, means you finally actually ship the, you know, published live code, you know, uh, uh, meaning you actually turn turn the switch and turn it on after depending on the scope of the project, 12, 24, 36 months, maybe years. If it's a government project, five years, 10 years, it's insane. Well, guess what? Three months after you started, the needs of the customer have changed, right? And you are complete, you've moved on to another stage and you don't even know it. So that is fundamentally why this pro these process, the stage gate process is works in a world where everything is set in glass and you know frozen in time and the world will not change until you finish the whole project. 
That's why it doesn't work at our <laughs> world, which is why you need an iterative approach. In software, that means you have short sprints. You're actually, you don't create the entire software. You do little pieces and you go through the entire cycle of talking to a customer, building something, testing it, and then actually deploying it for them to really use. You do that whole thing in two weeks. And it, and it works well on software, but the question is how well would it work for when you're building a, a big, big instrument? And I think that's one of the things I learned in researching the book. It looks somewhat different. The time scales is not exactly the same. It's not necessarily a two week spread. If you are in an industrial manufacturing company delivering gases to hospital plants around the world, if you are a company building a heart, you know, an implant, uh, 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 these kinds of things. But the iterative approach absolutely works. And it's the only thing that allows these projects to actually stay on track and not go wildly over budget, wildly over time, and completely fail to solve the actual problem for the actual customer. So now I have, I'm going to go back to a couple of very specific things you said. One was, okay, um, business case. Business case gets in, in most large companies, legacy companies in our industry. We have to have a business case even before we understand anything about that hypothesis. Uh, yeah. And so, and without that business case, there is no money for iterative planning or anything else. How have you seen that shift happen in real life? Because that business case and the funding model go hand in hand, and they also tie to what the company has to tell their shareholders. So how do we how do we change this fundamental thing that is driving behaviors opposite from what may be good for us in the long term? Yeah. So this is why, to your point, culture and process, it, absolute, or as you, you drew out, and it's it's in the book, one of the kind of running themes throughout it is the kind of culture and mindset and organization and process are interlinked. Each one shapes the other. So you're not going to get people to actually behave differently unless you do change the rules that are, you know, putting up roadblocks and making it impossible for them to take this iterative experiment-driven approach. So it has to start with budgeting, right? You can't really do this unless you break the trap of the kind of classic business as usual uh, approach to budgeting. Um, and there's a couple ways to do it. I mean, really the optimal way, if you're in a position of authority, is you create, my goal here is not to say throw out old organizational models, right? It's to say we need to be more flexible. I talk about the idea of having a flexible governance model. So we are not taking the same approach to manage every decision in the organization, right? When some of them are life or death and some of them are not, and some of them are highly regulated and some of them are not, right? We do not take the same approach to allocating resources to, you know, a well-established part of our business that's been running for years or decades versus a new te a team that's looking at a new, solving a new customer problem, right? We need to have different models of oversight, of compliance, of funding, and so forth for different parts of the organization. So, uh, look, I had a great conversation with actually someone who was in the healthcare space uh, last week who was saying, he said, yeah, we, we things really started to change when we got our new CFO and he came in and really want, no, she came in and she really wanted to change things up. And she said, um, uh, her mantra was no budgets. And people said, well, when do we, what do the budgets do? There's no budgets. We're no longer doing budgets. And people were like, what's going on? Well, she wasn't really throwing out budgets, but she was changed. She said, we're not doing everything by annual budgeting anymore. But she knew that was such an ingrained assumption. She had to like blow up people's, you know, kind of orthodoxy. And then when they said, well, how do we get money? And basically what she did was an iterative approach to funding, right? There's still a process. So you need to set up, you know, typically, you're not going to change all of the, the the budgeting, maybe at once, but you're going to say, if we are serious about innovation, if we are serious about trying to tackle some new opportunities for growth, if we are serious about going after something like changing the patient experience or the end users, uh, the, the healthcare providers experience of some aspect of how we interact with them, right? These are the things you're not going to know the solution going in. And those things have to be funded differently. They need an iterative approach to funding, which is 
essential before you can then say, we're now going to take an iterative approach to pursuing it. Because if you say the team, I want you to rapidly experiment and do what are, and see what's here, and maybe it's a huge opportunity. Honestly, probably it's not, right? You should assume most new opportunity, most new ventures are going to be shut down. Well, but if you give them all, if you green light them all with 12 months of funding, and then your assumption is that 70% of them will be shut down, and honestly, 50% of them should know that they should be shut down within 90 days. Like it shouldn't take you a year to figure it out. Well, why are you funding them for a year? And that's why there's this whole business case because we're giving too much money up front, right? In the first round of, of iterative funding, you want to give as little money as possible. Yeah. And I'm getting very excited over here as I listen to you because that's also one of the reasons why we see these projects going forward that really should have been stopped a long time ago, but we won't. It's the sunken cost thing, right? Um, the I sunk cost fallacy is, you know, is uh, companies have to get much better. Companies think it's hard to come up with ideas and, and to empower people to try new things. That is not the hard part. The hard part is getting comfortable and really good at shutting down most of your cool, exciting, promising uh, new ideas because most of them won't actually work. Yeah. And I think you talk about the difference between are we, you know, are we paying to learn or paying to earn? And and there's a time for both. And there's a time for the financial case. There's absolutely a time to say, okay, well, now we're going to really figure out our projections of the unit economics and, and, and where it does, at what point is this going to turn a profit? What's the scale? All those things are essential questions, but you don't start with them. <laughs> That's right. Okay, so we've I think we've covered four now. We we ended up going. Uh, you know, we've done the validation part. We we got to uh, managing. I, we didn't call it that, but we got to the governance conversation, which is about how you manage at scale, right? Exactly. So the, the the third step is like, what does the team need to be doing? How do you actually take a business opportunity or business problem and take this iterative approach to like that, like a, like a so agile software team in short cycles and sort of, you know, test and learn and build. But the fourth step is what we just talked about. It's the, it's the funding process. It's the shutdowns. It's the oversight process. Having a different kind of governance model for these opportunities in these teams than you do when you're running a, a sort of a steady state part of your business. Good. And then the last, the fifth one, grow technology, talent, and culture. You put those three together and in and, and sort of one point. Why? So they are all, in a sense, capabilities. I wanted to make the distinction between, as we think about digital transformation, we commonly start here. I see a lot of organizations who say, well, we know there's going to be some growth opportunities. We know things are changing. Uh, we know data is going to be more increasingly important. So what we need to do is uh, improve our, our technology staff. We need to invest in the data we have. We need to hire a bunch of developers and, and, and uh, um, you know, business model uh, innovators. Um, and we need to, and, and then, and then we'll be ready, right? That doesn't work. The reason why it doesn't work is because there is no generic set of technologies that every business needs in the digital era. There's no generic sort of talent mix that you need. So I find it's much more, it's much more effective to first start with, again, step one, what are we trying to achieve and why, right? Where are we going as a business? Where do we see the world going? What's the space we want to occupy in that future state? And why are we the ones to occupy that role, right? That's really what that, that sort of shared vision is all about. Then starting to say, what are some things that we're really going to focus on? Some our strategic priorities. Then to at least get started on the process of how do we learn to actually tackle these or approach these in an iterative uh, uh, experiment-driven approach? And what does that mean we now have to undo or refashion about our organizational processes and resourcing and so forth? If you are even, I'm not saying you're done and everything's, you've solved all these things, but you're starting to address each of these. Now you will actually know which are the biggest technology gaps that you face, right? which are the ones that are most urgent. You're not going to address them all in a year, three years, maybe five years, if you're a big company with a lot of technical debt, right? So now you start to understand, it starts to come into focus, what are the things, this is, these are all long-term. You do not, you know, 
rebuild your technical stack, your, your technology stack and move from a you know monolithic architecture to a modular architecture of microservices in 90 days or even 12 months, right? You do not, you know, close the gap on talent of various kinds that you need in your organization from, you know, software developers to machine learning experts to data scientists to people who are going to drive innovation because they come from outside the healthcare industry or they've had experience in an entrepreneurial role, not just working in a big, uh, a big uh, a life sciences firm. You know, all these things, you're not going to solve all those techno all those talent gaps again within three months nine months 12 months and culture you are not going to shift the culture. so these are all this is like investing in the long term as you start to get clarity of where we're actually trying to go and how you'll start to see what are these gaps in our what i all of them are kind of long-term capabilities it's our technology and data right it's the talent in our people and people, including partners. It's not that neither of those is something you necessarily have to solve entirely inside your organization. Let me be clear. And the third is the culture. Really getting clarity as a leader of what is the what are the biggest differences, the biggest gaps between the culture that has brought us as an organization, brought us to where we are today, right? Hope, I'm sure some degree of success if you're an established business and been around for some time versus the culture we need for where we are going now. Right. So culture has to match strategy, has to match where we're going as a company. And as you get really clarity as a leader of what are the things that we need to shift, maybe we need to become more data driven and less you know, driven by expert opinion. Maybe we need to become more collaborative across people with different functions and silos and different backgrounds rather than being sort of insular. Maybe we need to become as just as a mindset, more kind of willing to take risks and be entrepreneurial and less sort of looking for approval and, and, and someone else has to make the decision, right? Whatever those shifts are, really being clear about them. And, and then you can start to really sort of focus on how do we change them over time. So going back to the 30% now, I'm, yeah. that, that have succeeded, are there specific cultural characteristics that that we can clean out of those 30 to say, these are the types of things that we need to see in the culture. How are they, have they changed for also their power structures? In terms of the culture, yes. I mean, I would say there are some really common shifts. Um, I mean, I alluded to a few of them already. Uh, you know, the shift from sort of a lot of organizations whereby, you know, Culture is really about behavior. I want to be clear. It is not about sort of our ideals and our virtues and 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 uh, what inspires us or something. It's actually about like when we're talking about organizational culture. It's about how do we behave? How do we run a meeting? How do we make decisions? Who do we CC on an email? These kinds of things. Um, and so, you know, some of the common shifts are uh, that I see the companies that are really making a difference. They are becoming a more data driven and and that doesn't mean like data science this is about everyone in the organization is empowered to make decisions by defining what the question is what data will help you answer that question and then bringing forward data ideally you know arguing pro and con the decision you're making right that's that's something we see very much in the culture of certain organizations it's very contrary to the tradition of who's the highest paid person in the room right and that's how we make decisions. So that's really about empowerment, not just data driven. It's it's power it's empowerment really using data as a as a mechanism to empower decision making elsewhere. A more democratic approach to decision making and a more less sort of personality uh, emotion, you know, a uh, kind of driven approach. Um, another shift is towards much more of kind of an entrepreneurial culture. And this doesn't mean you're necessarily like literally in a innovation lab where you're sort of building a new line of business, but you have a sense of ownership. That's another word I would use to describe this kind of mindset. I have a sense of ownership over my work, the area, the part of the business we do. And I feel like it's my job to figure out how this should be better and to bring it about. And I feel because of the culture, I feel the autonomy that, that that's expected of me and that I will be able to uh, really take ownership and make make these decisions. So that's that's a mindset that's really critical. Um, it, it that feeds into what I call a bottom up 
uh, culture. So the idea being that ideas and decisions are not coming solely from the top down, uh, but you are assumed that at whatever level of the organization you're at, you should be identifying uh, opportunities. You should be identifying problems and issues. Uh, you should be that source of information, uh, both good and bad. You know, hey, people need to be, you know, raise the alarm, but also, hey, I see an opportunity. The customer wants this, or they love this thing we just did. You know, you see that that that's your role is to be part of this bottom up flow of information and decision making. Um, collaborative, as I said, uh, being used to and comfortable working in multifunctional teams, not with a bunch of people who are all developing developers or engineers or all marketers or all data science people or all, you know, whatever uh, 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 the role is, the companies that are able to move quickly at scale use this model of multi small multifunctional teams where the mix is different depending on the industry, even within a single company, depending on the problem you're focused on, but there's always an element of cross-functional collaboration with them in them. And that requires a different kind of comfort working with people who don't kind of use the same acronyms as you, right? Uh, so those are just some of the most common I've seen sort of culture shifts that organizations are going through. The last I mentioned before, I think also was risk-taking. The idea of rather than looking for uh, the safest bet, not sticking your neck out, um, uh, don't do something that might, you know, uh, attach your name to something that might not work, to being a little more comfortable, actually a lot more comfortable, taking risks because you see that it is not punished, that it is if they're smart risks or risks, you know, taken thoughtfully and managed thoughtfully uh, to mitigate the, the degree of the risk, but knowing that you're trying something that that may well not work, that that's actually recognized and and uh, and even you know commended and rewarded, that really starts to shift the culture around what people are willing to do. And, and that last piece is is critical and totally inherent in this iterative idea of of even um, thinking about the business at large. So you're taking risk, but you you also de-risking by the short cycles. So you understand what it is that you're learning and hopefully putting that learning into good use. Um, so, so then technology, because this is about digital transformation. And fascinating, isn't it, here that we're coming almost to the end of our conversation here. We haven't really spoken about AI. We haven't really spoken about all these new technology opportunities that are out there, nor the challenges around those like privacy, cybersecurity. This wouldn't be a digital conversation, really, would it now? But but I have to ask. And that's for a reason. You know, I, I, I talk about, you know, at the, at the start of the book, when I lay out, you know, my definition of digital transformation, you know, is actually that you know, digital transformation, as I define it, is this. It's, it's the it's the transformation of an established business to thrive in an era of constant digital change, right? So that really underlines three important truths here. First, just as you sort of said or teed up, digital transformation is not about the technology, right? It's about the business, right? You're using technology, but the, the aim, the goal is not to have more technology or the best technology or the newest technology or say, look what we're doing with, you know, hot technology X. It's to make an impact on the business, on your customers, on your stakeholders and, and, and on your organization. The second is that this is, as you underline, this is about established businesses. It's not about a new startup, right? It is fundamentally about the challenge and the opportunity of if you already have an organization, customers, products, services, revenue, business models, all these things are in place. Those are both a boon and a benefit, right? It gives you resources to invest in new things. You've got customers already. All these things can help. But they also, if you are not careful, all of these things that are already established will become the biggest barrier to change and innovation. And the third point in that definition, remember, it's thriving in an age of constant digital change, right? The third point is digital transformation is not a project with an end date. It is a continuous journey. It's a right? continuous it's journey. 
because the change is not slowing down. Gender, every, you know, it's it's not that like the internet arrived and okay, all these old companies have to spend a few years and kind of reorient themselves and then they're done, all right? You can say, okay, check, we did that. No, it was the internet, it was e-commerce, then it was streaming media, then it was smartphones, then it was cloud computing, then it was internet of things, then it was predictive, you know, artificial intelligence, then it was, you know, metaverse and AR and other stuff. And now it's generative AI and there's going to be something next. It keeps, each of these waves keeps accelerating the move to the next one. So we just got to get better and better at it. So as the companies are hiring these executive level new roles, I, I think, for digital transformation. Is that the thing to do? I mean, it's it's often helpful, uh, particularly in early stages. Uh, if you're making this a priority, um, you want to have someone who has a view of what's going on, right? It's not, I saw early on, and still sometimes companies think, oh, a chief digital officer, and well, there's the there's a C in their title, so they should have a bunch of resources and budget. They're almost it's almost like a separate you know unit or business unit. That's not really what effective people are, are set up for. This is about a role that is much more about coordination and influence. It's much more about changing, keep bringing people together, aligning people, agreeing on an agenda of what matters, helping different parts of the company from the CFO to, you know, compliance, to product development, to everything else, just to think about, okay, what do we actually need to change in the way we work to make this really happen? Having an agenda that has a CEO's backing. That's why it's really, it's a tough job and it's really helpful to have someone doing this. The CEO can't do it. They have, they have other things they've got to focus on. This really requires dedicated focus. But over time, if you actually start to change the processes, you start to change all the things we've been talking about, it starts to take hold. It becomes part of the strategy of every business unit. It's not some big digital transformation budget. It's you're actually changing every budget, like how it's spent and why. Once that happens, you probably don't need this person, right? Or you don't need that role. The person often will move into another job in the company is what I've seen. Right. And I, I actually like this, uh, your, your your pillar number five really being about capabilities because it's, it's understanding that the capabilities themselves that we need to have, they have a different nature going forward and they are enabled. They are enabled by technology in, in, in multiple different ways. Therefore, we do need to be technology savvy. We need to be open to using technology differently in our lives and actually specially, specifically in, in um, places where we are very data driven. We have massive amounts of data. There's a huge opportunity, of course, very quickly. Um, what I'm, I guess I have to ask you now the, a very technology specific question because AI is everywhere. And, and every time that we turn around today, there's something more that is said about AI in context of business, in context of our personal lives. What do you say about AI? Uh, is it changing everything? Um, what do you make out of all the, all the artificial? So, I mean, artificial intelligence is, it's a very broad term. Um, but, and it started as sort of an academic category and sort of a field of study, but it's now become really particularly in the last dozen years or maybe even 15 because of the development, because of the breakthrough and people have been thinking about learning systems, right? And developing versions of them for decades, right? But what's happened is one approach very broadly to artificial intelligence, to creating systems that simulate, you know, human decision-making and cognition and so forth uh, is machine learning. And that is creating things like an algorithm that actually trains itself, right? Rather than, you know, uh, uh, you know, classic example, a mathematician creates a model to forecast you know, I don't know, consumer demand for certain products or, you know, uh, some other thing in your industry, then what happens? The next year goes, you get new data, the model doesn't quite perform. And so a human, you know, statistician, probably the one who created the model, looks at the latest data and they say, oh, you know what, we should tweak the weightings or we should add this other variable in that would have been a little more predictive this year if we'd done that. With a machine learning system, the idea is the model, the algorithm, the formula trains itself. So it actually, you feed the data back in, 
well, that was the prediction. Here's what actually happened with you know crop production or, or consumer demand. And so it tweaks its own weighting, weightings. So that idea has been around for, for decades. But we had this breakthrough in what's called artificial neural networks. They are not neural networks, to be clear. It's a metaphor. Uh, but they are. Uh, it is a technical way of, of, of creating uh, computing systems um, uh, using these different layers. Uh, uh, and it turned out to be extremely powerful. Right? So we had this breakthrough, and that has led to lots of different technologies and approaches that have built on this uh, artificial neural network approach to machine learning. So right now we're at this really interesting place. So first we had, if you look back 12 you know, years or so, we had companies announcing, wow, uh, this new AI can play chess or it can play Jeopardy or it can identify you know, what is a mouse and what is a muffin in photographs from the internet or it can spot you know, cats in YouTube videos. And that was great from a scientific point of view. It was like, wow, it's you know, breathtaking that the system can do this. But okay, so what, right? That was sort of the, the, the G-Wow phase. Now we've had a dozen years, these systems are being used in every industry. This, what I would broadly call predictive AI. So you're looking at data and you're making predictions and anticipating what's next, what's the right uh, forecast, what's, what's, the, you know, what's the message that's gonna create a greater response, uh, more higher response rate from the stakeholders who are emailing or all kinds of applications, predicting, you know, uh, uh, you know, identifying from images, machine vision. We've got drones that fly over public infrastructure and identify what's a crack you should worry about and what's one you don't need to. There's a million applications being used. Uh, and you talked about you know, drug development, incredible applications in the science and gene folding and a lot of other applications using these kinds of models, right? So we are at this point, it's all kind of in the background. It's all very enterprise. It's not on your phone. So most people don't think about it it's been having a big impact every year, bigger and bigger economically. Now along comes the next breakthrough. It's broadly speaking called generative AI. At the bottom level, we're still using artificial neural networks, right? Uh, an approach to machine learning, but really interesting novel approach, this idea of large language models. And it's really exciting and fascinating and hard to get our heads around like why it works sometimes and completely fails in others but it is emerging all sorts of capabilities. But right now there's this weird gap between the hype and the reality. So right now, 99% of the hype about AI is about generative AI. Everything's about the chat bot and the dolly and the image generator and oh my gosh, and the, there's now a YouTube channel on that's uh, creating news every day, but it's, it's all you know, uh, LLM generated. Uh, uh, it's all just, you know, generative AI images and, and, and virtual uh, uh, avatars telling you the news and so forth. The real business value is like 99% from the prior wave of AI, right? From the predictive artificial intelligence. We are still at the, in almost every industry, we are still at the playing around with it, which is great. The test and learn, like, how would we use this generative AI, like in my job? Not like cool demonstration, right? Not enough, the equivalent of show me the cat in the video, but like, okay, how can I actually like take one of the things I have to do every, every week in my job and do it much better and faster with this as a tool? We're, we're figuring that out. I have no doubt that within really in the next couple of years, we're going to start to see big value uh, created for in, in many different sectors. But I know that in almost every case, we don't know yet what that's going to be. So it's a really interesting time, uh, and I'm very interested to see sort of what comes next. But you know, that's my take on sort of where we are right now in the sort of era of of artificial intelligence. Yeah. So, what do you tell to the business leader who who wants to be ready for what comes next on AI? Well, I, I actually wrote uh, an article on my uh, my Substack, David Rogers. My website is davidrogers.digital, and you can click there to subscribe. It's a free newsletter. I write every week, and I wrote one recently called uh, "Chat GPT is Not a Strategy," um, and it sort of, you know, a started with that point <laughs> that you know it's not a strategy, right? Focus on the problems you want to solve, right? That's where I see the companies who are doing this effectively. They take pre-existing problems, customer, stakeholder, internal, right? Issue, something that doesn't work, that takes too much time, that's ineffective, that's unpredictable, whatever. Is this? And they ask. 
could we use one of these new tools to improve this, right? And the advice I lay out in that book is actually how do you do that as a process, right? How do you set up people inside your company right now to be experimenting? Really low stakes, low cost experiment. This 2024 should be the year of learning for generative AI in almost every organization, right? Don't be thinking, oh, we're going to get a big pay financial payback or windfall in 2024. Uh, but it's a great opportunity right now to start figuring out where could this really start to fit into our business and really make more and more of a powerful difference in the months and you know few years ahead. And the people thinking about that, based on what we just, based on what we've just been talking about here, really need to put that thinking gap on in context of the future, in context of the problems that they want to go after, as well as um, this whole idea that uh, we have the right to win, right? So if, if you know, I, I, I love that in your book as well, that you know, we figure in this out because future is as much ours as anybody else's, but we have to go there. You, you, you've got to know, you know, why, what makes your business unique? Why does the world need you? Why would you be missed? Why would the world miss you if you were gone as a business is a common question I'll ask the leaders. And you got to find that answer. You've got to know, and then you'll start to have that confidence to say, Hey, yeah, we can do this. We can do these new things. We can try new things that are unproven and knowing that Many will not work, but we will manage, we'll de-risk de them and, uh, you know, put people and resources in appropriately, we'll learn quickly. And then when we find the things that are ready for commercialization, for development, we'll be ready to then like really move in hard and fast and accelerate and, and bring them to scale. Because that's the great thing about an established business. If you find that right opportunity, it is easier for you to scale it more quickly because you're not a startup that doesn't even have people and it's like, how do we... You have a lot of resources at your disposal yeah. if you know how to use them the right way, right? Well, David, it has been an absolute pleasure. I, I appreciate Thank this. Thank you, Taria. Um, and just for our readers, I want to show this book one more time. It is called The Digital Transformation Roadmap. Absolutely. He's got it too. <laughs> there we go. And a little closer it, to the camera. And, and I will absolutely recommend reading this. It's a, it, there's so much more there than we could cover in one hour. Um, David, what's next for you? I am just really excited to, you know, I am meeting with companies every day across every industry and, um, really the chance to sort of work alongside them. I do a mix of advising companies, uh, um, sort of executive workshops and keynotes. And then at Columbia, I actually teach executives, which is so fun and exciting. And I bring together, you know, groups of people from very different industries, all in one room. Fascinating thing, day one, they all come away with the same, you know, eye-opening moment. They say, all these companies in totally different industries, they're actually facing the same problem I am. Well, the same problems. So it's a it's it's such a pleasure to teach with that kind of audience. I learned so much from them. Um, and then I'll keep writing. As I said, I you know I, I you know I'm a slow book writer, but now that I'm I've you know got my newsletter going, it gives me a chance to write and engage with readers every week. Um, so it's it's a going to be a very fun year ahead, and so many fun questions to keep digging into and tackling uh, with the help of so many brilliant companies. Excellent. Well, thank you so much. And uh, I will definitely be reading your, your newsletter and also watch out for the next book. Terrific. Thank you, Tarya. I hope you enjoyed today's conversation. Check out leadersagenda.com for information on our past and future episodes. And I do hope that you engage with us also on LinkedIn, Twitter, or Facebook. And post your comments about what you heard today and your ideas forward. Kitas, thank you.